Yes, no matter how you start. Yeah. 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 All right, well, I'll speak a bit louder then. Um, thank you, everyone in the room and on Zoom uh, for joining us for today's RSM Speaker Series event. Um, we really cannot be more excited to welcome Dave Wollner uh, for a talk entitled Moderating AI and Moderating with AI. Uh, I'm sure everyone is excited to hear Dave, so I'll offer just the briefest note of introduction. Um, Dave was a member of Facebook's original team of moderators, playing a key role writing its earliest content policies and building the teams that enforce them. After leaving Facebook, he took on roles building the community policy team at Airbnb and as head of trust and safety at OpenAI. And he is now a non-resident fellow in the program on governance of emerging technologies at the Stanford Cyber Policy Center. Uh, Dave's experience in content moderation and trust and safety spans almost the entirety of their histories as fields. So we're extremely lucky to welcome him today to hear his thoughts on where the space may be heading. So with that, Dave Wilner. Hi, folks. Yeah, um, it's great to be here. Just wanted to start by apologizing. As, as uh, was noted, it's, I've been doing this the entire time, and it is all my fault, so sorry about that. Um, I wanted to sort of make a case to all of you around the use of AI in content moderation and how I expect it to change things. I have come to think that powerful foundation models are going to fundamentally transform how we do moderation. Um, there's been a lot of focus on the novel risks that those models present. Um, that's, that's fine, those things are true. I'm not gonna dwell on that today. I think it's been fairly well covered. Uh, but the models are also, because of their unique capabilities and ways of working, going to be very useful in solving problems that have previously been intractable. Um, that's, those sort of solutions are also, I think, going to prove deeply relevant to uh, alignment questions in AI itself, because at least today our current ways of controlling and steering models are themselves downstream of techniques that actually have a lot of shared DNA with how we do content moderation for the present. So just to sort of briefly recover who I am, why you should care or think about any of this, I have been working in this field for about 16 years at the forefront of sort of controlling social technology, first in social media, then in the sharing economy, then in AI. Um, I spent a lot of that time trying to not just grapple with the problems of emerging technology, but grapple with using emerging technology to solve the problems it creates. So in addition to working on policy itself, um, I spent a lot of time at the intersection of operations policy and tooling and figuring out how we actually do the rules that these platforms claim to have. Um, and I'm going to dwell a lot on that, that question of actual performance in, in the talk today. Currently, I'm a, a fellow of the San Francisco Policy Center. I'm spending a bunch of time on this subject, learning how to use LLMs to do content moderation uh, with a, a guy named Samid Chakrabadi, who's another fellow at the center. He ran Civic Integrity at Meta uh, from 2015 to 2021. We ended up doing the same fellowship sort of coincidentally and we're having very similar thoughts. Uh, beyond using off-the-shelf models, we're also doing some work trying to train smaller large language models to be good at this task specifically, um, because we think that more efficient models uh, to be able to do this would be a really helpful contribution to the space. Um, I bring all of that up just to make the point that my perspective here is very much a practitioner's perspective, not an academic perspective. Right? I come to this as someone just desperately trying to solve these problems for the last nearly 20 years. Um, and very focused on what practically works and how we use these tools uh, in practice, not merely in theory. Um, so first, to just sort of set the table about why I have this strong belief about, about the importance of AI in the future of content moderation, I want to do some grounding about how I see content moderation today, uh, why it works, and, and frankly, why it doesn't work very well. Um, I think there's broad spread agreement it doesn't work very well. It doesn't seem like it would be controversial to say here. Um, bad things keep happening to clearly innocent people. Watching the child safety hearings in the Senate uh, earlier this year is enough to sort of demonstrate that to anyone. There are very serious social externalities that are going on. And 
this has naturally led to a lot of public theorizing as to why. There's a lot of discourse in the atmosphere about why social media uh, moderation doesn't work well. And I've come to think we're basically having a problem of evil conversation about tech giants. Um, the problem of evil is this idea in theology that's concerned with reconciling the existence of a benevolent and omnipotent God with suffering in the world. And we're having a problem of evil conversation about Mark Zuckerberg. Right? If, if uh, Mark Zuckerberg is good and in full control of Facebook, why do bad things happen to people on his platform? Um, and a lot of the popular explanations focus on this idea of benevolence, right? There is either the notion that they aren't trying, that the tech platforms don't care, they're indifferent. Uh, there's the notion that they're greedy, that they sort of do care, but they don't want to spend the money. Or there's the notion they're actively malicious, that they have bad values that are, that are antisocial and that we don't want. I, those things may or may not be true. I don't think they're the root of the problem. The root of the problem is that they're very far from omnipotent. We're, put another way, we're bad at content moderation because we're bad at content moderation. We're not good at doing the core activity. And to understand why we're bad at it, it's important to take apart moderation into a couple of components. Values and the actual classification task. The values piece of moderation receives a lot of attention. There's a lot of discussion about what the rules should be. Um, community policies are primarily understood, I think, as expressions of companies' values. That's not untrue, but it is not the most significant thing that those policies express. I, I've come to believe that the focus on values is a form of bike shedding. Bike shedding is this idea, sort of relies on a story, sort of like gaslighting, uh, that if we were all on the board of a nuclear power reactor, all else equal, we would spend more time discussing the color of the new bike shed of the reactor than we would discuss in nuclear safety because more of us can have opinions about colors and bike sheds than are qualified to have opinions about nuclear safety. Values function in that way in this discussion. Everybody has values, so it's easy to have opinions about values. Uh, the reality is that the sorting task underneath the values, the classification task, is the thing that we are very bad at and that dominates any possible set of values. Um, to get into why sort of classification matters, it gives you some examples of how that is the case. Um, there are lots of situations where the value proposition that you want to achieve is not particularly in dispute, but where the ability to do it is very, very hard. Um, to give you some social media examples, reclaimed slurs are a great example of this. It's very intuitive to say we want to allow people who are members of the community to use certain language, but actually doing that requires you to know at scale who is a member of that community, who they are speaking to, what the actual context of the conversation is. So, Doing the thing is hard, even if agreeing on whether or not the thing is good or bad is hard. Um, similarly, uh, the controversies here often make, are often made worse by public pressure. Um, Facebook's breastfeeding photos controversy back in 2009, 2010, was very much one of these problems of classification. The question of should breastfeeding mothers be able to upload photos of their children uh, on Facebook is not really that interesting of a policy question. Getting a moderation system to very consistently distinguish between nudity where there's babies involved and it counts as breastfeeding and nudity where there's not is hard and flawed. And so the ability to execute on the policy is challenging. Um, the Napalm Girl incident that happened in 2014. Uh, Napalm Girl is a reference here to a photo that won a Pulitzer Prize. Uh, it was a photo of a, a girl who'd been attacked in Vietnam. Uh, it's very, very intuitive to say all of the Pulitzer Prize winning photos should be able to be on Facebook, but you have to know what all the Pulitzer Prize winning photos are and get everybody doing moderation to know that too, or you can't actually achieve that policy goal. Um, so why are we bad at large-scale classification? Well, we're bad at large-scale classification because fundamentally we're trying to solve an industrial scale problem with pre-industrial solutions. Um, social media is this mass distribution machine that requires no intervention from the internet. Right? It allows billions of people to talk to billions of other people nearly instantaneously without any direct human intervention in the communication itself it is pure mass production of speech. Um, but we don't really have mass production capability for the ability to moderate speech. We're still stuck in essentially a piecework system. Uh, piecework was a, was a way of manufacturing textiles and, and articles of clothing uh, sort of in the early industrial revolution when we invented like yarn uh, machines, but hadn't yet invented machines that could do sock knitting. 
Um, and so work would be parceled out to people in their homes to be done in an artisanal way to a particular spec. Moderation today essentially works exactly like that, right? We have specific people, sometimes distributed, sometimes in one place, working against a document that tells them how to generate content as, on, a, on an artisanal level, except they're doing it on mass. And systems like that have trouble achieving very high degrees of consistency. We don't have machinery to do those core blanks of the process. And I'm going to sort of get into a little bit why humans struggle so well, so much to do those processes well. Even where we do have machinery for different parts of this classification process, the machinery itself mostly replicates the problems that humans introduce into the system as it exists today. And then I think finally, the nature of language itself uh, probably caps how well we can do this. We're not you know, making machine parts here or, or knitting fabric, we are ultimately dealing with classification of language and culture, which is a fuzzy activity inherently. And so the upper boundary of excellence is probably fairly low. Um, that said, until we make progress on at least some of those human or machine constraints, we're not going to see better moderation online. Um, I think AI is going to help with that because it surpasses both human capability and the capability of our current machines in a number of very specific ways that I'm going to get into after this, after sort of digging into specifically how humans fail, uh, because the ways in which we're inadequate to these tasks are important to understanding the ways in which LLMs have proved to be helpful. Okay, so why are human beings bad at classification? Um, we're bad at classification for a lot of physical reasons. Our working memories are really, really small. The length of the sort of content policies you can feasibly write as a policy writer are like maybe a few pages, maybe five, maybe six. That's not because we couldn't write a much longer treatment of what hate speech might be or what, how to tell whether a photo contains nudity. It's because most people can't actually use a hundred page document about what hate speech might be to make a thousand decisions a day. Um, particularly not if you want them to stay up to date on what that document says and you're changing it all the time. Um, our long-term memories are also very unreliable. I sort of alluded to this into the, in the napalm girl context. But sort of notions of art, which is again the thing I think we all think is probably good and want to have be on Facebook, or notions of what a real name is, are basically lookup questions, right? There's no art pixels. Art is just all this stuff we've decided is art as a society. And so in order to treat that stuff differently, you have to know what it is, which means you have to remember what it is. And people are not terribly good at remembering huge amounts of very specific facts about individual pieces of content. It can be done, but that's what getting a PhD is for. It's not something that you do as an hourly job. Um, we're quickly exhausted. This work gets coded as introductory level work, as entry level work. But focusing intently on content for thousands of repetitions for eight or 12 hours a day is intensely, intensely draining. People get tired, they make mistakes, they get bored, uh, which is another sort of understated part of this. There's the trauma and emotional part of the labor has been much discussed, and that is very much real. But honestly, a lot of the time, the work is dull. Uh, many of the things you're looking at are not interesting to classify, they're not violating, they're just kind of random noise. It's a little bit like staring at white noise on a television screen and waiting to see if something meaningful shows up. And it's very hard for people to maintain focus under those kind of conditions. Um, we rely on our own internal models. People don't really use the rules to make these decisions. They read the rules once, use them a couple of times, internalize some sort of approximate model of whatever the rules say well enough to not get in trouble with their boss, and then just keep doing that until they get in trouble again. And so as these rules change, uh, people lag in that change. Um, we also typically can't recall our reasoning. Um, if you ask a given moderator why they made a particular decision when they made it yesterday, if they made a thousand decisions, they're almost certainly not going to be able to tell you. And so while this is this human process which sort of seems like it has meaning, the meaning is often not retrievable. And then finally, and this one is often hardest for folks to grapple with, we really do not have any shared common sense. And, and there's a couple of specific examples that were really important shaping my thinking here. So we, and warning up front, all of this is going to get a little unpleasant from a content point of view. Um, we were trying to figure out how to classify CSAM, child sexual um, abuse material, at Facebook, for the purposes of creating the photo DNA databases that today underlie a lot of the attempts to control that material online. We had 12 folks who'd been doing this for a year, had been reporting information to NECMEC that entire time. 
These were full-time employees like me. These were kids who went to Stanford and Harvard. And when we asked them to classify material as simply report to NECMEC and not report to NECMEC without talking to each other, they could only agree about 40% of the time. And they've been doing this for a year on what you would intuitively think is the worst thing, the easiest thing to get consensus on. No consensus. And most other areas are actually worse than that. Um, when we first tried to outsource nudity moderation to India, we, we ran into a similar problem where we had uh, rules that had said, also take down anything that is sexually explicit beyond a bunch of particular things we listed. And immediately, the moderators started taking down uh, photos of people kissing and holding hands. Because what we meant and what they understood those words to mean were not the same. Because you just can't assume shared reference or shared values. Um, all of that is made worse by the economic way we currently organize this labor. Right? So the work is very notably poorly compensated. I think some of that is probably inevitable given both uh, the sort of scale at which it's done and a bunch of the other things I'm going to get into here. Um, enforcing, being sort of forced into consistency is pretty demoralizing. It's an alienating form of labor, particularly because this is labor where people have strong moral feelings about what they're being asked to do. And so it's unnatural to, being, to be asked to put on a sort of another, another morality, but putting on that other morality to get everybody on the same page is like the heart of the activity. So you kind of can't avoid that. And that is itself draining and not a ton of fun. Um, so people who have better options leave, right? These are high turnover jobs as a rule. Um, uh, in the context that this is well known in the context of our customer support, but even for Airbnb's outsourced trust and safety teams, the average retention is about nine months. Um, it's a very, very short period of time because when people have the ability to do better work, they go. Um, that undermines the accrual of expertise. It also means that you have to invest the time into sort of training and updating the system because you're constantly teaching new people to do this stuff and having to constantly reorient them as you make changes. So the entire system is extremely cumbersome and doesn't need to sort of update your excellent results. Cool, okay, I hopefully have convinced you at this point people are not, not good at sorting things into piles. Um, why is our automation bad at this, right? Our existing automation is bad at this because all it's really doing is statistically copying what all those people who are not good at this did, right? Our, our, our most advanced automation <coughs> techniques, our black box machine learning, is just predicting what a human moderator would do if you asked them to sort a piece of content according to a policy. It's just a mathematical simulation of the results you would get if you had bothered to ask a person, which is very useful to be clear, because a lot of the time it does a pretty good job and it means you can avoid asking people, which is great. Avoids trauma much faster, has some real upsides, but it also means that it inherits the fuzziness and the unreliability and the non-specificity that we bring to that process. Um, there are other forms of automation, but they're, they're actually even simpler, right? They're either asserted if-then rules, exact word or pattern matching. They're all even less nuanced and less capable. We have no automation that does the activity that humans are actually doing as part of this classification process. We only have automation that simulates the outcome of the activity that they've been doing. Um, and actually, the automation we have today adds a bunch of other problems. Their decisions are meaningless very literally meaningless, right? They're not making an argument about why a particular piece of content fits or doesn't fit a given policy. They're simply saying 95% this is shaped the same way as other things you told me violated this policy. There's no meaning to the decision, which both makes it hard to debug individual decisions and is very disturbing for, frankly, people who are subject to those decisions because we want these things to have meaning, uh, to be able to dispute them and to be able to argue with them. Um, Updating the models is also extremely cumbersome. Uh, training large machine models uh, on, under current circumstances needs thousands, tens of thousands of examples, which means every time you change a policy, not only are you having to update the humans and wait for that to all phase in, you then have to wait for all those humans for the tens of thousands of things to then be able to train your machine model, machine learning model. So our automation is also often very out of date to the point where it's typically not fully synchronized with whatever a given platform's policy allegedly is at any particular time which is confusing the results and outcomes that are not ideal. So, also, machines not very good at classification, at least under current circumstances. And then on top of that, I, I think the best we can ever hope for here is significantly less precise 
than what we can ever hope for in material manufacturing, right? Despite all of the manufacturing analogies I've been making, we are not, in fact, making steel cylinders with a metal frame lathe. We are playing around with words, and words are inherently vague. Um, the language itself is just not terribly precise, and that's particularly true in mass scale social media, where people often write, frankly, fairly badly or unclearly or approximately from a jargony point of view. Um, everyday language is not meant to convey precisely specific meanings. It's meant to be efficient in communicating between people with a shared context. And social media moderation doesn't share that context. It's a very radically postmodern exercise. All of the authors might as well be dead. There's only the text. You're sort of just staring at these word words after the fact. And that renders them very, very difficult to understand. A version of this is the conversation about cultural context that comes up a lot. Um, having more specific cultural context is helpful here. But that's only a version of it, and in a lot of ways, the easiest version to solve. Right? Um, local interpersonal context is as big a part of this problem as broader cultural context. If I call you an elephant, am I calling you old, wrinkly, gray, fat, wiser, or Republican? <laughs> right? The, there, there's, no, there's no way to know the answer to that question outside of our specific interpersonal relationship, um, and there never will be. And so we're sort of tapped at the maximum here. So that's the, the doom part of this. Um, as an aside, all of the problems I outlined are also problems for AI alignment under current circumstances. So our primary techniques for AI alignment, reinforcement learning, rely directly on curated data sets of desirable behavior that we are trying to get the machines to copy. All we're doing in RL is curating a set of prompts and responses uh, to the model and from allegedly from the model that we want the model to behave more like, and then doing a mathematical process to get the model to ape that behavior, which means that ultimately what we are aligning the model to do is dependent on the same kind of content classification and has the same kind of content classification problems that I've just been talking about in the social media context. And you can see this in the two kinds of reinforcement learning that get talked about most frequently. Reinforcement learning with human feedback, which is where we're having humans do the classification. And reinforcement learning with AI feedback, which is where we're using AI to do the classification. Like even in the activity itself, this is, this is baked in there. And then all of our other techniques for controlling the output of generative AI today are just wrapping content moderation techniques around either the input prompts that people send to the model or the outputs from the model in response to inputs. It's all the same stuff. And so thinking about how we can do this core task better is relevant both to social media, but actually also deeply relevant to conversations around AI safety. And you can see this in the Google, the Google Gemini blow up, um, which was, at least from my point of view, almost certainly either some poorly thought through alignment instructions or some poorly thought through uh, moderation of the and moderation and modification of the incoming prompts to try to correct for problems in the model itself. It's simply failures of classification technique and a lack of nuance in, in doing that task. Um, as an example, uh, ChatGPT, when we first launched it, wouldn't tell you facts about sharks because we had taught the model that violence was not good. We didn't want it to help you plan violence, and we also didn't want it to graphically describe violence. And it wildly over-rotated and was like, got it, bears are canceled, no more bears, we can't talk about bears. <laughs> Which is this, this perfect example of this sort of classification and over-response of these kind of systems. So, setting all of that context, generative AI, generative AI actually I think going to be very helpful here. Um, used properly, it is possible to, uh, for it to exceed both humans and machines under existing real circumstances. And by used properly, I mean a very specific thing. So the naming generative AI is in a lot of ways I think distracting for this purpose. It's more important to understand it as language parsing AI, reading AI. It's, we have machines now that can do something that functionally is equivalent to a human reading a document and responding to what it said which means we have a machine that can directly address the core activity that a human moderator is doing instead of merely producing the result. And I'm not speaking theoretically here. This already works shockingly well. Uh, one of the first things we did internally with GPT-4 
uh, when it became available to us in August of a couple of years ago, was try to figure out how to use it to do content moderation. And within a week or two, uh, me and a couple of other engineers were able to get to 90% plus consistency with my decisions with the model, reading a document that you, any of you could read and following the instructions it provided in order to classify content. Um, and things have only gotten better from there. OpenAI published a blog post about this uh, middle of last year about using GPT-4 with content moderation. There are multiple startups pursuing this path, and it's something that I've continued to work on at Stanford with Samid, who was particularly interested in fine-tuning smaller models to be able to do this, because the smaller you can make the model, the more broadly adoptable it will be. Doing content moderation with GPT-4 is a little bit like going to a grocery store with, in a Ferrari. Like, you get there, it's very expensive and most people don't have one. And so building a smaller, more compact, more usable, more broadly accessible system seems to us to be pretty important. But when I say you can, in fact, use these models to read policy text, follow it, and classify content, that is not theory, that is already happening. Um, and used in this way, the LLMs directly address a number of the problems with human moderators, right? Their short-term memory is already better than ours. The largest models have context lengths of hundreds of pages of text. And so you can load tons of information into a model for making a specific decision. Their long-term memory is or will be more reliable using things like databases plugged into a model to be able to give very exact recall of large amounts of information. They don't get bored, they don't get tired, they don't lose focus, they don't seek better jobs, they don't experience trauma, right, which is, is a pretty important part of this. There is, there's, I think, a real moral case to be made here as well. Um, we can reasonably expect them to record what they did and why they did it according to the text as they understood it at the time, every single time they make a decision, and store all of that information, which helps with things like the requirement for explicability that is embedded in a lot of recent uh, they're also way, 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 way faster. Uh, even the largest models are much faster than people, even doing this very cumbersome policy text-driven process. Um, and then on the flip side, the, the, the LLMs are better than existing uh, machinery because, again, they're directly doing the task. And so they produce responses that are scrutable, or at least feel meaningful. Right, there's a broader like philosophical question here about whether or not they're really reasoning. Honestly, for these purposes, I don't think it matters um, because they are producing reason-shaped answers in language and those reason-shaped answers can be used to debug the decisions the model made by changing the instructions you gave it. So when you have a model make one of these decisions, if you don't agree with its decision, you can simply ask it why. It will make a bunch of words at you Whatever you sort of think metaphysically those words mean, they are useful for understanding how it was functioning, and you can incorporate that feedback back into the policy text to produce changed behavior. And this works really, really very well. And so it's functionally equivalent to an explanation in the sense that it is a word-shaped response that helps you understand what happened and why and do something about it. And so, at least to me, a lot of the sort of hand wringing around whether or not this is true reason is irrelevant, at least functionally, for this task in the short term. That's not me dismissing those concerns in a sort of longer term, more AGI focused way. But for this purpose, with something like GPT 4, it, it, it's neither here nor there to a very great degree. Um, I'd also point out that when you're dealing with really any people, but certainly people in a mass bureaucratic system, we don't understand why anybody does what they do either. Uh, and it's very, very difficult to sort of get that recall or get reasons that mean anything out of the systems as we have them today. So it's also not super clear to me that the alternative is really well thought out, clearly described reasons. Um, I don't want to stand here and, and sort of make the case that this is magically going to solve all of our problems. So please do not take me as saying that. So, First, the systems themselves will have flaws. Um, they're going to make mistakes. Some of those mistakes are downstream of some of the sort of language limits that I talked about earlier. But some of those mistakes are simply going to be errors or problems with the performance of the model. They're going to have biases. There's been a fair amount of reporting about this already in the use of these systems for things like uh, hiring decisions or other kinds of adjudication decisions. That's very real. I'm not minimizing that we need to work on those problems. 
but I would say that at least those are static engineering shaped problems instead of the situation we have now where all of the individual moderators also make mistakes and also have biases, but who they are changes every nine months. And so understanding, correcting for, and controlling those biases is essentially, I think, impossible at present because it is this sort of roiling mass of chaos. Simply pinning down the biases to a single set of them such that we can start to try to study, understand, and engineer and account for them feels better and more tractable than where we've been, where there's this essentially uh, like ever churning cauldron of biases that is never static and therefore cannot be stabilized. Um, I also do think that this is going to, circling back around to my earlier point, that classification is more important than values. I weirdly think if I'm right about this, we're going to have more fighting about values because we're going to be better at doing the thing. And so what the values are is going to start to matter more. And I think you're going, I think you're already seeing shadows of this in some of the sort of woke AI culture war stuff that is starting to creep into AI alignment conversations and some of the reaction in Gemini. So oddly, as we get better at doing the activity, we're just going to fight more about values. Um, that said, I, I do think, and I, I sort of lampshaded this earlier, I think it's morally urgent that we figure out how to do this, even, even given all of those flaws. Having people continue to do this work is, is bad, right? And there's been a lot of focus on ways in which the work conditions can be made better, ways in which pay can be more equitable, breaks can be given, preventative techniques for controlling wellness. All of those things are good, given no alternative. Uh, but in a lot of ways, they seem to me to be questions of like engineering a, a better radiation suit when maybe we could just have a robot do it instead and not worry so much about radiation protection, right? Like the problem with radium girls making watch faces wasn't just that they were licking the radium, it's that they were painting watch faces with radioactive material, which is like not a safe or good idea. Um, and I think getting to the point where we can relieve the sort of direct coal face labor here from humans is an actively good thing even though it is fraught. Um, I think that's actually doubly true for marginalized groups, personally, right? Part of the sort of perverse shadow of the request for more cultural context being rejected into moderation is it's essentially a call for the enlistment of people who are victimized by speech in the controlling of that speech to begin with, which is perverse uh, when you think about it that way. Um, this will mean, I think, job losses, particularly at BPOs, but again, it's not clear to me the job losses are per se bad if the jobs themselves are dangerous, toxic, and not conducive to human thriving. I also think it will need more jobs overseeing these systems on the, on the flip side. Um, so even with all of those caveats, this is a really big deal if you accept the case I have made to you. Not just, because it's not just going to mean we are going to lift and drop AI in place of human frontline moderators, right? it will change the kind of systems that are viable to have. Um, it opens up new, new sort of like possibilities of moderation. Um, things like super deeply personalized moderation become more feasible, ambient moderation becomes more feasible. I think in the future, LLM powered systems are going to allow things like Siri to prevent your grandmother from being pig butchered over the phone, which is an like, inconceivable thing to try to do right now, but seems very possible in this sort of future, in the same way that deeply personalized moderation filters seem possible. Um, it is utterly transformative of the policy drafting process. Right now, a lot of content policy is basically astrology about how moderators will work, will react to the words that you wrote. Uh, you're sort of guessing, because the update time is so long and retraining is so cumbersome that you can't really do empirical testing of the outcomes of your decisions feasibly these systems respond instantly to your word changes, which means you can actually test different versions and approaches to things and see how that produces different outcomes, which is revolutionary in terms of the, the, the policy process directly. And I think it also is going to op open up new policy vistas, not just new processes, right? Um, right now, we have generally global moderation standards on the social web um, because, frankly, it's too cumbersome to do nation by nation moderation for anything but the most sort of large scale blocks. That may no longer be true, right? We could potentially start to think about really localized or regionalized moderation standards. Um, 
And then similarly, like different moderation philosophies that no one has ever really, to my knowledge, seriously tried to engage in at scale become possible. Things like deeply intersectional approaches to moderation, which no one has ever tried to do because it's just like wildly cumbersome and impractical, might become possible with these sort of tools. Um, a bunch of those ideas are probably bad, to be clear. Like I, I'm not saying all of the things I just said should happen. I'm saying they're now not impossible. And there will be other better ideas that are now not impossible, which is going to be very interesting. Similarly, changing the cumbersomeness of our moderation technology will change the kinds of platform designs that are valuable. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion of network effects in social media. Yes. I think an under-discussed aspect of the reason we've seen a lot of centralization in social media is how annoying moderation is to do at scale. I have been very skeptical of federated solutions simply because I did not understand how that was going to work at the level of Mastodon except scaled up to Facebook size. These sorts of systems might actually provide the ability to make that kind of a system work. Um, just as an example of the sort of consolidation I think you naturally see due to moderation, think about Reddit and the power mod situation. Reddit is technically the sort of flat federated system, but the reality is like a few thousand people moderate half of Reddit because it is in fact a full-time job that has caused a bunch of concentration in the sort of bureaucratic processes to do that moderation even in a system that is designed to be not. So I think that's really, really interesting. Push to the extreme, why are we even talking about post hoc moderation at all if I'm right about this? Why aren't you ending up in dialogue with the text box you're trying to write in about whether or not what you're saying is constructive? Again, maybe creepy, maybe a bad idea but a possible idea now, and I think there will be more versions of that. Um, these systems are also going to create new kinds of abuse, right? Ultimately, this technology is technology for sorting things into piles, regardless of what your piles are and why you want to do that. Um, so it is going to be useful for things like uh, censorship and surveillance. It's gonna be useful for things like job owning. The virtuousness of these tools is simply a product of how they are used. It's not a product of the tools themselves. I think we could easily see the law start to try to specify exactly what your content moderation prompts and standards will be. Um, that is probably a bad idea, but I suspect we will see some folks attempt it at some point as it becomes more and more possible. Um, all of that said, though, I think this is coming no matter what. I'm really quite sure that some version of this is going to come to fruition, and so I think we all have an obligation to sort of embrace it and try to figure out how to use it well now so that we're not left on the back foot uh, when it becomes increasingly prevalent. So with all that said, A, hope that was convincing, uh, and B, just want to leave you with a, an even more provocative question, which is, uh, what would the internet look like if we weren't terrible at content moderation? The internet has been assumed to be a sort of semi-anarchic space. There's been a lot of discourse about how that has become less true over time, and some, I think, amount of wistful mourning for a freer version of the internet among at least certain quarters. But really, we're still pretty bad at content moderation. If I'm right about this, I think it might start to really seriously change the dynamics of how the web even could work in ways that I think are really hard to sort of get our heads around. Maybe bad, maybe good, but worth sort of noodling on insofar as you accept the case. So, with that, I'm done. All right. Thank you, Dave. Um, I'm just going to start out with a couple of related questions from folks online, but if people have questions in the room, just flag down my colleague. We'll be running around the mic. Um, the first question um, uh, deals with, uh, you mentioned sort of the ability to retrieve the reasoning of LLMs when they're making these decisions. Yeah. How does that intersect and interact with the possibility of hallucination? And then also, um, policy statements are often intentionally kept high level and broad, and how well can LLMs capture the socio-cultural context um, from broadly or that are relevant to uh, implementing broadly described policies? And a related question to that, to that second point, um, uh, words change, or the meaning of words change pretty rapidly, and increasingly so, um, especially with regional dialects, and how does that, how is that addressed, or um, how does that uh, interact with the, the set of problems that you're describing? Yeah, uh, great question. So on the sort of uh, recall of reasoning, really specifically what I'm proposing there is asking the model to actually 
print a reason that you then store every time it makes a decision. Um, the hallucination question is a little bit separate from that mechanically. In the context of how we've used these so far, you're actually feeding the model the policy text every time as a prompt. And that is that sort of grounding in the specific document you're using it to make, you're asking it to use to make a decision is very helpful, not perfect, but very, very helpful in controlling hallucination. Hallucination is often worse when you're asking the model to sort of remember what it knows. Whereas if you're asking it, what does this document say that is helpful in reducing hallucination? That is, it is absolutely an issue. Again, though, people also make all kinds of really weird choices. Um, and so the question is not, is that an issue or not? It's, is it better than the status quo and will it continue to improve? Um, we have spent, um, you know, nearly two decades and billions of dollars trying to squeeze more juice out of the human moderation lemons. And I, I just don't think there's any more juice in those lemons. But we have some new lemons and maybe there's, maybe there's juice there. Um, you had two other questions. Um, the, the changing meaning of words over time and yeah. how that's, that's happening rapidly these days. Yeah, so that, that definitely is a problem. Uh, part of that is something that you can address with the sort of database and long context uh, stuff that I was talking about, where you simply tell the model, here is how you will understand words to be understood for this task at any given time. Um, and so there is actually, I think, in some ways, more ability to direct models there relative to people who, again, also have that sort of freshness problem. Um, so there, there are very serious advantages about keeping everything on the same page. And we have a question in the room. Hey, Dave. Hey, right there. Um, so I'm glad you didn't fell the Berkman Klein Center this year. Uh, and I used to work on content moderation issues before I got to law school. Um, you know, I think the time horizon for what, what people were concerned about with like social media and content moderation, I think like when you were first starting, like yeah. on Facebook way back in the day, probably a lot of folks in the Hill in particular weren't as concerned with content moderation, they weren't thinking about it as much. I think you fast forward to today, like it probably would be, I don't know, probably most legislators, folks on the Hill know a little bit about section two, at least they've heard about it, right? It seems the time horizon with like artificial intelligence and specifically generative AI is much shorter, but the, the fear and like concern with it is, is also much shorter too. Like the, the, the rise in concern happened much faster than I think the content moderation issues. And I'm wondering, to the extent you're speaking to like policymakers or regulators, what do you, what do you, or if you have thoughts for them, what are you saying to them about like things they should actually be concerned about instead of like maybe some of these like culture war, or, like boogeyman type issues? Yeah, I, there's been a lot of focus in the, the sort of focus on AI around longer term questions. There's been a lot of discussion around bio risk and similar issues. I actually think that I'm not saying those aren't important. But I actually think we sort of missed the boat a little bit on some of the shorter term content related issues, um, less in the text model space, but in the image uh, and video model space. Uh, open source image models are able to generate uh, large amounts of CSAM, and it's really, really difficult to control those. There's been some interesting work from SIO around this topic right now. I think regulators are over focused on the long term versus rel some relatively specific short-term problems that are happening that honestly shouldn't be super controversial from a cultural war point of view because they revolve around some pretty core abuses that we still do have social consensus on. And uh, another question in the room. Yep. Go ahead. Yeah. I don't know if I'm actually next, okay. Seems like one difference between the internet that worked fairly well 20 years ago and the one that doesn't work that well now is the scale that you've talked about, yep. but maybe the answer here isn't to try to you know, throw more AI into the problem, but to you know, back away from the large scale and back to a time when you had many people on many different platforms, each of which had its own you know, idiosyncratic moderation policy, and people would just sort themselves into the communities that they felt they belonged in. Um, yeah, th this is essentially the federation proposal as a solution. I am skeptical of federation as a solution because it doesn't address the worst kinds of harms. Um, because some, like space owners, are going to be bad actors. But insofar as we're dealing with harms where the issue is I don't want to be exposed to a particular kind of content, sorting is great and, and we should encourage it. This isn't me saying it's like a bad thing. It doesn't deal with the kinds of harms where the problem is content that people see about me, right? The problem in the context of NCII, non-consensual intimate, intimate imagery, isn't that I saw my nudes. 
is that you saw my news, right? Um, and so there's no really great answer sort of absent a central authority for those kinds of problems. And those are in fact the worst harms that happen in the content space, nearly universally in my view. Dorotich uh, from, Sorry. oh, Dorotich from Slack. My name is Matilda from Behind Vision Business School. I work with the uh, UN on uh, online harms regulation, particularly CSAM, and with MIT on AI analysis. So my question uh, uh, to you is, uh, you have mentioned NECNEC. -NEC. Uh, there are many developments uh, currently that are leading towards end-to-end -to -end encryption. And we know first what, what happened with the CSAM regulation after WhatsApp went in end-to-end uh, -end encrypted. How and, and now we are seeing the same with uh, uh, Messenger, right? So how do you see these uh, these developments that are leading towards uh, anonymization or end-to-end -end encryption and all of these other similar uh, developments affecting the moderation? Thank you very much. So this is where the sort of like wild possibility stuff gets really interesting. Um, and I, I wish in a lot of ways we had a healthier conversation about the trade-offs between my no, 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 you're no, good. Yeah. Uh, I wish in a lot of ways we had a healthier conversation about the trade-offs between privacy and safety because I think they are real and they're uncomfortable and that leads us to sometimes try to dodge them. Um, when I say that, I feel like when people say that, they often sort of steer into a and we're overvaluing privacy versus safety. That's not necessarily what I'm saying. I'm more saying we need to be honest with ourselves about difficult trade-offs and the downsides that they carry in both directions. Um, I also think, though, that some of the stuff I'm pointing to might have really impl interesting implications about ways to compromise. Um, you could conceivably, if I'm right, get an AI moderator to be really, really excellent at interdicting certain kinds of super problematic material and lock it inside of an encrypted space such that it's never doing reporting, but it is doing interception. Again, maybe a bad and creepy idea, but a now not impossible idea in a way that previously that was sort of outside of the design space to Consider. So I think there's some interesting implications for even that tension of, of some of this, if I'm correct about where it leads. Great. And just a couple of questions from online. Um, one is asking you about uh, how the moderation, tuning, and red teaming of LLMs themselves has parallels to and differences from moderating social media. Have the generative AI companies learned the lessons they should have? And then a, a couple of related questions about using um, using generative AI in linguistic and cultural context other than English and outside of the minority world. Yeah, so um, in terms of the similarities and differences with social media moderation, so content is content, right? At, at, at some level, the products here are not, AI is not capable of making a picture that a human could not make conceivably. It does it more quickly. Um, but you know, we have Photoshop, we have been uploading, billions of us have been uploading things onto the internet for a decade. So functionally, all of the photos that can exist have been on social media. Uh, and so in that sense, yes, there, there very much are lessons to learn. Um, and there has been a movement of trust and safety professionals with social media backgrounds into the AI space, I think because the companies do, do realize this. Um, there are other parts of it that are unique and red teaming is actually one of those areas where it's particularly unique. And that's because the, the question with red teaming, which is the, the process of sort of prodding the model to try to get it to do something that it shouldn't do, uh, is a multi-turn conversation. It's not just an interception or a single sort of pass question. You're, you're essentially trying to convince slash bully a robot into generating something for you that its creator is trying to teach it not to create. And that process is very different than sort of testing social media systems because there is evasion in those systems but there isn't that sort of convincing process in quite the same way and that is is really interesting i do think the ai companies so it's hard to generalize about them right google is a very different thing than open ai or anthropic as an organization because it's a massive behemoth that directly owns a bunch of social media open ai and anthropic are both very much startups and so have they learned uh, the lessons of social media is sort of a weird question to ask about that group, but I do think that we are not starting over in quite the same way. There's still an organizational capacity building question, particularly on the startup side, but there has been a lot of, of learning from that. Uh, in terms of low resource languages, it's actually a great question that I skipped over in my notes, but um, supporting low resource languages and cultures with traditional moderation solutions is really hard. There's 
there's as many people in Massachusetts as there are in Serbia. And um, that's difficult to staff for. And Serbia is frankly like a fairly big example, right? As you get to smaller minority languages, that becomes really, really hard. Um, LLMs aren't going to magically solve that, but I do think that if we intentionally train for them to be capable of it, they will eventually prove better at load balancing because you can support the capacity to understand those languages in detail better than you can when you have to get a group of humans, where if you want 24 seven coverage, 365 days a year, you're talking about at least 21 people to cover, you know, like a decent, a decent amount of, of uh, a decent amount of content. And so that gets difficult to sort of uh, justify if you're not seeing enough content in a particular language to actually justify that many jobs. So I, I think there's hope there as well. But it will require focus. It's not just going to magically happen. And just another round of online questions and we'll move back to the room. Um, two about sort of the commercial implications of what you're describing. Um, one question is asking for your bull and bear case for when a company could implement 100% AI-powered moderation that's fast, cheap, and accurate. And another question um, is asking about the way in which content moderation uh, has become a competitive advantage for some platforms. Mm -hmm. And uh, do you think the development of AI moderation models will commoditize uh, content moderation for better or for worse? Um, taking the second one first, it's already commoditized. Um, and in, in a lot of ways, the fact that it is a mass-produced commodity is sort of the thing that I'm pointing towards and I think a root of a lot of our, our, our problems. Um, I do think we are going to see trust and safety as a field and moderation as a part of that move in a direction that is more similar to cybersecurity over time where there are more external vendors that are providing solutions instead of everything being homegrown and roll your own, which is the case of today's very largest platforms mostly for historical reasons, because the external tooling and solutions just like didn't exist. So we had to build them because there was no one to buy them from. I suspect that will change over time, and I think you're already seeing some of that. In terms of the bull and bear case, my, my, my bull case is like now, there are startups that will do this for you. And at least if you are focused directly on text and you have a flexible definition with the, or flexible relationship with the definition of cheap, uh, they can do this pretty well with automation using LLMs today. Um, once you talk about sort of images, that is also possible, but probably not even any reasonable definition of cheap. Um, Bear, it's less about possibility actually than adoption. Right? Bureaucracies are slow to change. The uptake of new technologies into these sort of big processes is slow. It's always slower than everybody thinks it's going to be. So. I've been using five years as a number, but that's kind of because I don't have any idea what the future is going to look like more than five years from now. Um, not for any really good thought through reason. Super interesting. Thank you. Um, so you said that you think that one of the, the problems with these AIs is that they're relying on early chat, and so there's kind of like a cap, which is the cap of the highest performing crowd workers. Right. Uh, and then many of the benefits that you talked about for using generative AI in this context were more of like, they don't have the same problems of exhaustion and lack of memory and stuff as humans. Yep. Do you think that the first set of problems of the cap of like the best crowd workers will also be removed such that AI is able to exceed human performance even in like the most focused and best human context? Or will that always remain we only will see the, the benefits from the kind of soft replacement of the soft weaknesses of humans? Um, I suspect it's going to exceed us for these kinds of tasks, even under our best conditions. I am positive it's going to exceed us under the actual conditions, um, is I think the way I, I would think about that. Um, but that is mostly a statement about how difficult and mediocre the actual conditions are. I, I, feel like I don't think it's a super high target, let's put it that way. Uh, another example. I have had it change my mind. In working on policies with one of these systems that I was using to label content and asking it why it made a choice that I thought was the wrong choice, I've had it respond to me with an answer that was better grounded in the policy text than the reasoning I was using, such that I was incorrect, if correct is defined as fidelity to the document I gave it. Hi, um, I'm from the University of Toronto. I'm, I'm a law professor there. I'm super sympathetic to everything you're saying. Um, and my, some of my colleagues at U of T in the tech space have been telling me how good things like GPT-4 are at classifying um, content. So 
Um, I sort of say that because I want to kind of push a little bit on 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 some of what you're saying, um, not to undermine kind of the direction you're going, but to maybe open up another problem. So you know, you, you gave some examples where people just like that the amount of disagreement on human labelers is huge, yeah. um, and that's a problem. Um, and you also talked about, well, we have values in the policy, but the problem is at the implementation level. And one of the things that, you know, this proposal does is it turns that implementation into, instead of this sort of human problem, into an engineering problem. So here's a perspective from law. Law we deal all the time, as an analogy, um, we deal all the time with these kind of broad policy-like statements, rules, whatever, um, and we have to apply them in the real world. And the application is deeply normative all the way down, right? It's not that there's a values and then there's implementation. The implementation simply depends on do we have enough information and other things like that. And so, and we have these in, in law, it the often is like deeply contested. So it's not just that we can't agree and there's some ground truth. We can't agree and it's normative all the way down. So what law does is it doesn't give you the right answer. It settles the matter for a period of time. Right? And that's open to change. And in settling the matter for a period of time, we agree to that if we agree that the process is legitimate. Right? And, and, it, and once that trust goes away, then we've got lots of problems, as we can all know. So what interests me about your proposal is, you know, there's all these problems with the human moderation. We can have a, a technical model, um, and we can learn how that model settles the matter. But there's no ground truth, so we still need to answer the question about the legitimacy of that. And so that seems to open up kind of interesting possibilities, like how could we do that? Um, and I'm just kind of curious what, what, what you think of that. Yeah, and actually this there was a question that you had asked online that we skipped when I asked you for recall around the sort of policy standards being very vague. Um, that is true of the standards that are pub, and I'm going to navigate this and answer your question. That is true of the public standards that most companies publish. The actual written standards that are being used to make these decisions, those things are basically like PR for what the actual rules are. The actual rules are very, 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 very detailed because they are trying to solve this problem of interhuman coordination. So they get extremely explicit and exhaustive. And you do need to write in that explicit and exhaustive, not high level way to get good performance out of these LLMs. So that it is a very sort of very, very concrete um, writing process. You're totally right about uh, legitimacy. I think there's some, and this is not an area where I'm an expert, but there's some really interesting experiments going on around using the models themselves to gather people's preferences and help to sort of combine them to create proposals for policies of various kinds. And Thropic's done some interesting uh, experimentation here of using sort of an input process to figure out what those rules should be. And a lot of what is cumbersome about a, and again, in a non-expert understanding, but a lot of what is cumbersome about those kind of processes today is because of how manual they are and actually using sort of AI assistance systems to sort of gather those things in a more dialogue-based way might actually make doing them at scale more practical, which is really cool. So there's some, there's some very interesting sort of directions there where gathering the input as to what the rules should even be as a way of establishing legitimacy might also become easier under this system not my area of focus or expertise, but I, I think it's a valid problem and I think a really, really interesting one. Um, and also your point is totally correct about sort of there not being a full difference between values and implementation. Don't, please don't read me as saying there is. It's more that the act of performing the instructions, whatever they happen to be, has a technocratic component, which we can be good or bad at. And also there are these values things intersecting with that. And our technocratic inability uh, is a big part of the problem as the system exists today, particularly because at least at the mass scale we're talking about, which I can't figure a way for us to get out of, the sum of the processes that law uses to make these decisions simply will not scale up. And so we're sort of stuck in this more technocratic mode, thus the focus on improving the technocratic mode. Just another question online, but I think we have a few more in the room as well. Um, one question is that you seem to imply that as uh, content moderation improves, the work of trust and safety will be focused on updating content policies. 
Um, what would be your guess of who decides these policies? So related to what you were just saying, will it be platforms themselves, the users of platforms? You were talking earlier about platform assemblies or citizen assemblies. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess the question more broadly is about um, mechanisms for deciding those values as uh, implementation becomes increasingly automated, potentially. I think it's going to depend on, so, so a couple of things. One, even with more automated implementation, you're going to need human oversight over these sort of frontline decision clouds decision-making agent clouds to make sure they're still dialed in. Um, so there is very much going to be work. I think that work is going to move from being frontline labeling work to sort of quality oversight work in addition to the policy work. Um, I also, in terms of who that decides the values, it's a really interesting and difficult question because this is an adversarial space, right? So at a very high level, it's pretty easy to get, like, want to sort of have buy-in systems to create legitimacy, and we should do that, and that's great. At the specific level of exactly which things violate which rules and where do we need to tweak language, that becomes harder to run consensus processes for simply because the amount of stuff that happens every day on our internet of three and a half billion people means that you're constantly responding to attacks and you do need that sort of flexibility. So I think that's going to remain contested. I, I mean, I think the obvious trend has been towards more government intervention in this space and I don't think that's going to change because it's a site of, of power and will become more accessible. Um, but I don't think it's going to like settle to one neat, great resolution where everybody's happy. Well, on that point, there's another question from online about how the regulatory space seems to be moving towards requiring some sort of human in the loop or human reason or, expl or explanation for content decisions. So the question is about how your proposal or what you see as the future, how does that intersect or interact with regulatory movement? Yeah, I, I think that this, I think the rise of Gen AI problematizes a bunch of the European moves here um, because they assume that a human answer is going to be better, more fulfilling, and more correct. And my basic thesis is that's wrong. Uh, and that we are very, very quickly going to end up in a world where some of these large model powered systems produce better, more fulfilling, feeling, more detailed, more accurate, with accurate being consistent answers. And they'll probably have to change the law, or Europe will just have a weird version of the internet. Probably some mix of the two. I feel like we'd stop with weird version of the internet. We'd have to go any yeah. further. Yeah. Um, I have one last question. I thank you for your time. It's been super interesting. Um, do you have any concerns about the idea that AI tools are also used to generate images, text, or otherwise to confuse the system or overwhelm it simply for the purpose of moving the needle in the norm? So you can think about it, you could basically keep gaming it until you push the norm to the place that your particular thing you want to say, or way that you want to articulate an idea, or um, misinformation becomes allowable if you know what the rules are and test the system until it forces it. So I, I guess I keep thinking, yeah, it's faster, but what happens if you also have the creation of text that's faster, learning faster, figure out what's, to, you know, what's being rejected and what's acceptable, keep moving the line of what's acceptable to where they want to go. So a couple things. One, most of these systems don't do online learning. So simply interacting with them isn't okay. going to change what they do. And you can decide as a system designer, am I going to allow that or not? And you, you wouldn't for, for that reason. The other thing, though, is I'd flip it around. Um, they're going to do that. So we need to learn to use the robots to help us because we're not going to be able to do this quickly enough, given the scale of what is going to happen, given the existence of this technology. So it's like less will you create that arms race? And more like the arms race is upon us, better start building battleships. That's never ended badly. What could go wrong? Thank you. Um, a couple more from online. We have some more in the room as well. We're technically at time, but I think Dave is generally- I'm not leaving until tomorrow. Perfect, yeah. <laughs> All right, um, well, a couple from online then. Um, one is, is anything that you're saying um, relevant to uh, data annotation? And could it solve some of the problems there? Yes. Yeah, I mean, the, what I'm proposing is a text directable classifier. It's just the sorting machine for content that sorts based on a document you wrote at, at root. So if you have a problem that's about sorting content and you can describe your feelings about how you want it sorted as a set of instructions, this is useful to you um, for a lot of different activities in the same way that it's applicable to both AI alignment and content knowledge. Great, any question in there? So I have a general question. So what is the difference between the, mod the content moderation and the content um, censorship? Because I, I think I'm a little bit, you know, confused with that. Do you have any, like, uh, dividing lines, uh, technically speaking, or 
I don't think there's a, I don't think there's a technical dividing line. To me, I think we are careless with our use of the word censorship. I think censorship is when a government does it, and maybe we sometimes even. But think, sometimes they overlap. You know the the the, the issue they cover. Man. I think you know. In, so the, the techniques the techniques overlap because again it's just a question of, of sorting. Uh, but Mark Zuckerberg does not own any prisons and has never put someone in them, and I think that is an important distinction, right? So from a technique point of view, yeah, I, I sort of flagged at the end of the talk that these techniques are definitely usable for malicious purposes by governments, whether well-intended or ill-intended. That is not disentangleable from the existence of the technology from a technique point of view. Uh, if you're sort of hinting more towards jawboning or the pressure that gets put on companies by governments, that will remain a problem. It's a problem today, independent of the existence or non-existence of these techniques, and is a thing we need to continue to, to work on as a society. A um, couple more questions online. Um, one is about the future uh, of volunteer content moderators, potentially on places like Reddit. Um, uh, do you think that those sorts of worlds will still remain, those sorts of spaces will continue to exist? Um, with, with the sort of developments that you're describing? I think they'll change. I think your role will move from being the actual direct content grader to being someone who is dialing in and overseeing a version of these systems maybe provided by Reddit themselves to actually help you do this such that you can scale that up with less direct human labor, which if you want dispersion of power at who is overseeing subreddits is a good thing actually because it'll allow normal people in sort of their spare time to viably moderate larger communities without having to professionalize. I really like your uh, comparison between the development of industrial machine versus an artisanal machine in the case of content moderation. Uh, you've been in and out of the of the uh, the platforms and um, of the platform, and I I would, I would I, is it safe to assume that. Um, these companies are underspending on content moderation based on uh, the legitimacy question uh, proposed here? Um, I think that's a version of the uh, benevolence thesis I sort of hit on up front, right? Like, I, I, maybe some of them are, some of them aren't. I don't. I don't think there is an amount of money you could spend with prior technology that would produce a result we all really loved. Like that, that, that's sort of the crux of what I'm trying to get across is like, we're bad at content moderation because we're bad at content moderation, not because we're secretly good at content moderation and mailing it in to be jerks. Like, um, also, yes, probably there should be more investment. And I, but I specifically think more investment in learning how to do what I'm talking about so we stop being bad at content moderation is is like important and there probably has been an under response on that score simply because a lot of the large companies are giant bureaucracies that change slowly and so i think a lot of this will get figured out at startups and smaller companies and then percolate its way up uh, or from like special labs within larger larger companies like i, I suspect you'll see interesting things in this vein from like jigsaw within google how quickly that translates into all of the giant processes google runs is like a bureaucratic question more than anything uh, perhaps a fitting question to end on um, from online. If if what you're describing it becomes the brave new world of trust and safety and content moderation, what are the AI skills you recommend someone interested in entering the field uh, develop or build? What sort of skill sets? Having a schematic understanding of how these models work so that you, you don't have to be able to build them, but at least being able to understand how they work so you understand what their sort of tendencies and properties and leanings are uh, is really, really important. Understanding that they're still ultimately just prediction machines, but they're predicting word outputs um, is, is helpful. Honestly, in the policy space, the same level of clarity of writing that is helpful for writing for like 10,000 guys at a BPO translates pretty well to writing clearly for these sort of machines, because a lot of the places where policy writing fails is when it moves into questions that are not discernible to the person who has to use the policy, right? So moving into things like, oh, what were their intentions when they uploaded this, which is like doesn't exist from the point of view of a content moderator. Um, so a lot of those skills actually translate super well. All right, well, unless there's any more questions in the room, I hope everyone will, oh, John, do you have a question? That's okay, well, I 
No, 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 let's squeeze it in. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm literally not leaving till tomorrow. Okay, I, I also know that people want to go to lunch. Um, well, I have uh, questions about some of the, let's see, I have a few questions, but um, I'll try to synthesize into one. Um, if you were, well, two, um, if you're gonna evaluate um, the up and coming startups um, that are entering this space, um, how would you evaluate essentially um, the viability and pedagogy going forward? And then also, um, of those, there are many of these problems, um, and just to give you background, I also have 17 years of experience yeah. working in trust and safety and overseeing teams. Um, I am, uh, yeah, concerned about some of the problems that I don't think we should be applying towards AI. And part of it is I worry about some of the issues of bias and inequity, sure. the calcification of the model itself, um, and not adapting to the space. And so I'm curious, from your perspective, what are the problems that you um, think we really shouldn't be applying AI moderation to um, or that we maybe need to do an adaptive hybrid approach, where it's like AI assisted, but certainly not AI deferred to, um, and and therefore also then what should startups in the space be avoiding? Because um, they all say that they're trying to solve it all, yeah. and I don't actually think that's um, a, a safe way yeah. to progress yeah. forward. Yeah, uh, in terms of evaluating startups, I would evaluate them the same way you evaluate a video, right? I would actually ask them to do the work and see whether or not they're producing uh, out, the outcomes that you want. And you should be thinking through how you really put them through the paces in terms of what the actual set of stuff you send them is, not just a random sample, but a like hard, weird, edge casey kind of stuff. I prefer, I would prefer personally, uh, startups where they're giving you a tool set for you to do it yourself, not saying like, hey, plug this in and we'll make all the bad things go away, because that feels like very much giving away your, your sort of control. Whereas a lot of the better ones aren't, they don't do anything on their own. They're like, here's a way to write a document and we'll fire this at the LLM for you in a structured way and you can set up your rules engine. So it's a, it's a system for doing the trust and safety work within, not just like a plugged in thing that solves all the problems, which keeps you in control of and able to assess whether or not it's working well, which I, is something I would look for and would want as an insider. In terms of where automation becomes dangerous. I There's an interesting question that you sort of got to in the second half of that around how much this becomes pure substitution versus like side by side working. That's actually what I, I think that's an interesting question from like, does it go to full replacement or does it go to like the actual interface moderators are working in just becomes profoundly different and, and AI enabled. That could be a direction it goes. I suspect it's a little of both, right? I suspect for some percentage of decisions like we're already in this world, right, where classifiers make the very easy and the very hard decisions and then humans make the middle decisions. I suspect, like, you're going to get another band of the AI made decisions and then the core is going to be this AI assisted set of human decisions. I'm not proposing taking humans out of the loop entirely. And I do think human oversight over sort of the instrumentation of the model decisions you have going on will continue to be important for any foreseeable future. Um, that's a little like in the weeds for a half an hour talk, but I do think that's pretty important. I don't know that I think there are any categories of decision that should never be made by a machine. I think the question there is who will achieve better results for the people impacted by the potential harm. Um, and so I think bias is an obstacle there that we need to account for, right? A, a very important one. But to me, the question is what is the most effective method that, create, that both like intercepts the harms we're trying to deal with and creates the least amount of suffering for the people who are part of the process. And if AI wins that, AI wins that. And if there are situations where it doesn't, it doesn't. Then you should use the thing that is best, personally. All right, well, I hope everyone will join me in thanking Dave. And uh, we'll be back here next week for another uh, speaker series event. So people will join us either online or in person. But uh, thank you again, everyone.